This is Partners in Crime with Adam Croft and Robert Dawes. We're nearly, so very nearly, in March. The weather's warming up, and so are we. We're getting the hang of this now. It's episode five of Partners in Crime. Well, here we are again. Episode five, Bob. Yes, Who'd have thought it? <laughs> Who'd have thought? Certainly not us. Um, I've got to admit, I've hardly watched or read anything this week. It was uh, it was my son's birthday, which is very inconsiderate oh. of him. Um, <laughs> plus, the weather's been a lot better, so I've been pottering around in the garden a lot this week. Um, so I've had a, something of a of a week off, which feels quite naughty to say, actually. Well, it's a good thing to have happy distractions, certainly. Yeah. Your, your son's first birth, uh, first birthday and, and a lovely garden to tend. Well, I, I, that's I, nice. It's good. You need I to so rest rarely the get the time off. Again. That's the thing. I so rarely get any time off. It's... Well, you have a very, very strong work ethic, Adam. Well, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, from my point, it's good to see you relaxing. Good. I, I do feel naughty. I do feel like the, uh, the boy who skived off school for a week. But there we go. Let's uh, get back to some more unpaid work with the podcast, shall we? <laughs> um, all, all I have done this week is I've knocked a, a few chapters off of the second uh, MJ Arledge book, which I'm in the middle of reading at the moment, the uh, Helen Grace thrillers, which are, are very good. Um, and I have bought, where is it here, And uh, the Blu-ray box set of Spiral, which I had in my ah. hand, which you, uh, you recommended to me. This, but, is uh, our, this is our theme throughout this, our episode so far, Spiral. the continuation of Spiral, <laughs> and I know I, I feed this obsession. Bob's but, love uh, affair with, can I, with oh, got it, I'm just, Let me just touch mm. the box. Mm. Yes, that's marvellous. I feel a lot better. That's, uh, <laughs> well, good. I envy you. I envy well, you. I, I do have a bit of a bone to pick with you over it, actually, because um, I bought the box set. Um, it's in French. That's not the bone, is it? No, <laughs> no, no. That's that's fine. Uh, that's fine. But the um, well, you I don't to... speak French, do you? Well, I, I realised that I had to buy a new Blu-ray player. Um, ah. The one that I had wasn't wasn't up to it. So I bought a new Blu-ray player, which again is fine. It's something I probably should have done a while back. Um, and then I unpacked this Blu-ray player, having waited for it to arrive, and got very very excited. I went to slide it into my TV cabinet, and it's a centimetre too wide. Oh, it won't fit in the TV cabinet. So um, so I bought a new TV cabinet. Sorry. That's one of the most absurd stories I've heard well, in a long time. That is marvellous. All I'll say so, is Spiral had better be good, because it's cost me about 200 quid so far. Well, exactly, but I'm sure your cabinet is a great improvement on the one that was there before. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Well, the cat had chewed the other one. It's um, It was a wooden one. Yeah. Uh, he, he's, he's got this habit of chewing on one of the corners. So I've, I've got a nice new sleek one, which hopefully will be cat Well, as long as you don't start so. chewing on the corners out of frustration at the extreme cost of watching uh, a wonderful French subtitled uh, crime wow. thriller, I don't mind. But if, good. If, if it's I mean, good, it's I don't mind. Have you started it yet? I haven't yet, no. Right. no well, I've, you've been um, gardening and having birthday parties. So yes, and, and yeah. buying furniture. OK, well, that's waiting for you. I envy you. I can't wait. I'll try and get onto it this week, so we've got something to talk about, at least, in the next episode, because that's me done. That was my week. Well, my week has been quite busy, too. I did a, a voiceover for the Guide Dogs for the Blind, oh. uh, um, which was quite quite jolly. Nothing to do with, with crime, um, uh, <laughs> I, I hope. Um, uh, but, but people... That would be a good idea for a book, wouldn't it? Well, yeah. If somebody commits a crime, but they didn't actually do it, their highly trained guide dog had been committing the burglaries for them. Right, well, I'll let you write that one. Mm. Um, no, I've been, uh, I've been watching... Uh, I watched the first episode of Collateral, uh, which uh, is the uh, David Hare's uh, new television piece. Very, very good, yeah. uh, I have to say. Um, it's, Sell it to me. Well, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a crime political th- um, um, thriller. Um, and oh, being, mean... being David Hare, of course, it's going to be um, uh, have lots of State of the Nation things to say I, I guess dare say as the, the series goes on uh, great strong performances from Kerry Mulligan as the leading DI it's a murder investigation it starts with the killing of a pizza delivery uh, <laughs> man who's just delivered a single pizza to the ex-wife of a Labour MP um, and it goes on from there it is it certainly has a great opening um, mm. and a, a great pace and with Kerry Mulligan uh, playing the leading role uh, Billy Piper and uh, the always marvellous Nicola Walker and a great supporting cast as well it's really very good uh, a few people have said that uh, you know it's a little bit clunky at times uh, sort of trying to get in little political statements here and whatever but you know that's that, that's, uh, that's well, David that's, that's David Hare yeah, yeah. it is so I'd be fascinated to see where it goes um, I'm hooked uh, that's for sure 
So that's on Tuesdays on BBC One. Uh, if you're worldwide and you can downplay, uh, download the uh, BBC iPlayer, it's on that. It's called Collateral, Collateral. by David Hare, Kerry Mulligan, and it's my recommendation of the week. Excellent, excellent. So you spent the whole week... Watching that, have you? Uh, no, well, I've, it's only one episode so far. <laughs> I have been watching another watcher. one. I've started watching another one, which I, I'll probably talk about next time. Uh, a new series starring Sharon Stone. But uh, I mentioned wow. that last time. So, uh, yeah. So, Excellent. yeah. And I've been actually reading the, the new Mark Billingham. Have you? Which is absolutely marvellous. But I'll, I'll talk about that to, to Mark in a minute. H- have you read my one now? Because I know in a, in a previous episode we were talking about yes. my, my new book being out and doing very well. And you said, yes, that's my, that's my read of the week. And then off air afterwards, once the mics were closed, you said, I'm looking forward to reading your book. Yes, I did say that, and I haven't. You see, this is this is this is the sad content that friends can actually show yes. each other. Uh, I, I mean, don't take it personally, and let's please carry carry on talking. No, I haven't, and I'll tell you why. Because I'm saving it uh, is my weak excuse, but it is nonetheless save the true. best to last. Uh, I'm yeah, I'm having a couple of days off, and I'm going to take that book with me. Um, mm. And so yes, uh, but I know lots of people who have been reading it. And think it's fantastic. So good, good. Um, they've got me off the hook on that one, <laughs> I hope. Well, you mentioned Mark Billingham, and he is this week's guest. We'll be talking to him um, in a little while about his best-selling Tom Thorne series of crime novels, which have been turned into a TV series starring David Morrissey. And he'll be answering your questions as well, which you've sent to us on Facebook and Twitter over the past few days. And we do read everything that you send, um, and we quite often will read them out on the show as well, if they're if they're any good. So uh, please do feel free to get in touch. You can tweet us at Crime Fic Podcast. We're on Facebook. Partners in Crime podcast. Our website is partnersincrime.online or you can email hello at partnersincrime.online. This week's guest is Mark Billingham, a man who's seen all corners of the entertainment industry as an actor, TV writer, stand up comedian, and since 2001 as a best selling crime writer. His Tom Thorne novels have topped the charts all around the world and in 2010 were adapted for television by Sky, starring David Morrissey as Tom Thorne. His non-Thorne novels have also been adapted for TV and Mark regularly appears on radio and television as an industry commentator. We spoke to him a little earlier this week. Now, Mark, uh, writers quite often get asked what their inspiration is for books and quite often we don't have... An interesting story to tell, but with your second Tom Thorne book, Scaredy Cat, you you have quite an interesting, <laughs> quite an interesting inspiration for that book, didn't you? Tell us about that. Well, I suppose so. I mean, I, it, the incident I think you're talking about was uh, that book was the first time I kind of wrote about it or wrote about something similar. Um, before I even wrote the first book, I was uh, I was a victim of a very strange uh, crime. In a, in a Manchester hotel room where uh, three guys in balaclavas burst into my room and uh, tied me up and put a bag over my head and kicked the uh, kicked the whatever out of me and, and uh, told me they were going to kill me and kept, kept me there for a few hours while they, they ran around Manchester with my ATM card. Um, and it was all very scary. I mean, I, you know, as, as brushes with violent crime go, it was all right. I mean, you know, at the end of it, I was still knocking around, no bones broken. I got everything back that I'd lost. You know what I mean? It's not, it, nothing too traumatic. But I, but I, but I came away from it um, feeling that when uh, I was going to write that first book, because I was, you know, I was toying with writing that first book, I very much wanted to make the victim front and center because uh, I, I got tired of reading crime novels where you had a cop and a killer and they're both on this sort of collision course and the victim or or often victims are just plot points you know they're just catalysts for a story and you don't get to know them or engage with them so I was determined to do that and I think it made me it made me pretty good at writing about fear uh, writing about being scared because that was the worst thing was just lying on that floor not knowing what they were going to do um being scared like you know not scared like you're on a roller coaster, not scared like you're watching a horror movie, but scared like, you know, am I going to see my wife and kids again? Scared. So, you know, I was able to key into that, I think, um, and to a degree still am. I mean, you know, um, I still I still get... I jump at loud noises. That's, really? that's the only, uh, so the only thing that I've been So there's still post-traumatic stress uh, uh, attached to it, understandably, because it's such a shocking, shocking thing to happen. Yeah, yeah. And, and there were at the time... I mean, at the time, I was still working as a stand-up, so I was spending an awful lot of time in hotels. 
um, up and down the country. And I mean, you feel safe in a hotel. It would never occur to me that you could open, you could answer a knock on the hotel room door and that there'd be three guys in balaclavas. It just never occurred to me, it, you know. So anyway, but so, yeah, it, it, it I, I used a similar kind of um, incident as, as part of the second book. And it's something I think has probably informed most of the books on, on one level or another. Well, it must be because most um, crime writers won't have experienced, thankfully, something as traumatic as that. So I guess they have to, um, uh, you know, second guess it. Like most writers do. Well, you say that. You shit. say that. Talk. I don't know whether you've ever interviewed Simon Koenig, but if you interview Simon Koenig, Simon Koenig, ask him about his traumatic incidents. It's actually, oh, right. way worse than mine. Oh, <laughs> my God. So one or two of us, one or two of us have uh, have had some experience. Well, <laughs> that does it give you a new perception of fear, then? That kind of in. I mean, it must inform everything. You're right, as as, as you say. It, it, no, it absolutely does because there. You know, I can remember I was lying on that floor and my heart was thumping so much I was bouncing off the carpet. I Good could actually choice. sort of feel my my chest leaving the carpet, <laughs> and and you know it it, it was it, and it just went very quiet. You know, when two of them ran 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 around were running around Manchester, they left one guy in the room. And I was, you know, hogtied with a bag over my head by this point. Um, and if I m- made a noise, which because it starts to really hurt after about half an hour, and you got your arms tied behind your back, and I'd I'd sort of groan and come over and give me a kick, and I'd shut up again. And it was, I was just lying there not knowing what was going to happen. In the end, in the end, they just left. They got what they want and just left. Um, and it was over. And 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 they never got caught. The police. The police didn't make uh, the best job of the investigation, shall we say, which was something else that kind of informed some of the writing as well. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, that doesn't always end as happily as it does in the novels, does it? No, absolutely it does. And, and again, that was something I wanted to reflect, you know. Um, I, I'm sure these three lads, and they were just lads, uh, were every bit as scared as I was. In fact, I know they were. Um you know, because they were risking a, a pretty hefty prison sentence for what? A couple of hundred quid cash and a watch and a phone? I mean, really? Um, but it was... Uh, but that's the was, air, well, area of fear that you worry because you, you think, my goodness me, you know, they're very scared about this. And yeah. that, 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 that fear that they have can lead them to take drastic action. Absolutely. Actions. It's, 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 it's how things can really escalate, isn't oh, it? Oh, goodness me. Well, I'm, I'm <laughs> slightly sweating just listening to you talk about that, Mark. Well, I mean, you know, obviously, obviously I still spend a lot of time in hotels when I'm on, on book tours and stuff. And, and to this day, you know, even if there's a spy hole, even if somebody, I, I can see somebody in a, you know, uh, dressed like a cleaner, I'm still going, ID, under the door. You know, I'm not, I'm not opening this door for anybody. Not yeah. taking any chances, no. Well, not to make no. light of it, but I'm in a Manchester hotel room on Wednesday night. So <laughs> <laughs> I'll yeah. be locking the doors. <laughs> um, well, this, this kind of um, the thing that you're talking about there with real life informing the books and, and you kind of di- discovering things um, at the same time as readers, something else I've, I've read is that when you were writing Tom Thorne, you, especially from the start, you didn't really have any kind of plans necessarily for where things were going and, and who he was and you're kind of discovering him at the same time as us readers do is that right yeah and that's still the case to be honest um i sort of took the decision early on i mean the the, the interesting thing was he wasn't actually the main character even in the first book i mean he mm-hmm. had that he had the most screen time i suppose there needed to be a detective so i created him so he was around a lot but the the character i really poured everything into in that first book was the victim um who spent the whole book in a coma and you're inside her head and stuff um then it became clear that Thorne was going to go on and there were going to be more books but i i'm still sort of grateful in retrospect that i didn't write this dossier on him you know i didn't say this is where he went to school and this is what he has for breakfast this is his family tree so i really don't know any more about him book on book than the reader does which gets you into trouble because sometimes I'll, you know, I'll get an email from a reader going, oh, you've changed the colour of his eyes or whatever it might be. So you can make little mistakes. But the the plus side is that hopefully he's he's still unpredictable. You know, I, I want him to be to, to be unpredictable, to be surprising, to often do things the readers are not very happy about, um, to go into areas that they don't approve of necessarily. Um, but that way I'm not I'm not bored with them, you know. Do you find that with uh, your with Tom uh, that uh, he's influenced you? Uh, obviously, as a writer, you influence absolutely your, your characters. Uh, but has anything that you discovered in your journey uh, over the novels with Tom influenced you at all in taste? Well, I you? think he's I think he's changed as I've changed, um, and I think we we kind of influence we we rub off on one another. I mean, you know, he's definitely not the same character he was. 
uh, you know, nearly 20 years ago. I'm certainly not the same writer or indeed the same person I was 20 years ago. I mean, which of us is? Um, and uh, I, I, you know, that change is important. That, that you know, we put these characters, crime writers, we put these characters through these this horrendous amount of grief and pain and death and loss and violence. Um, how can they not change? How can they not change just from one book to the next, from one case to the next? You know, if they don't, then they're just cartoons. Um so yeah, he's 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 like me in a lot of ways. I'm like him in some ways. But then again, you know, writers are always asked that how much of yourself is in that central character. Yes, there's a fair bit of me, but there's a fair bit of me in all the characters. You know, uh, the 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 villains as well as the as the you know the the the, the heroes. So um, yeah, you put you you put anything of yourself that you think will be useful. You talked about your changing over time uh, there, Mark. You've I mean, you've you've written, you've been a, an actor, um, and and you're also a musician as well. And uh, something well, I wanted to ish, ish. <laughs> something I wanted to talk to you about was um, how on earth you can end up uh, getting into a band with Val McDermott. Um, we we did put some <laughs> questions out actually to uh, yes. to our to our listeners on on Facebook and Twitter. We asked for some input, and uh, Alison Waterfield on Twitter wanted to know specifically how the fun loving crime writers came about and that's something that I'm very interested in too. Well in, in terms of Val, I mean I'll come back to Val in a minute, but Val and I had done had, had, had sung together before um, at the World Mystery Convention, I don't know, five or six years ago we we got up with a band and we sang Crying by by Roy Orbison and uh, and, and a couple of other things. Did, um, did you do it Only it, Fools and Horses style though? <laughs> no, I mean I, I knew Val could sing. I mean Val Val's a, a great singer and a guitar player um, and you know had a, had a, a history playing in folk clubs and stuff way back. Um, so I knew she could sing. The, the Fun Loving Crime Wives came about quite simply again at a, another World Mystery Convention, the one in New Orleans um, mm. the year before last and uh, on the last night there was a show at the House of Blues in New Orleans you know, incredibly famous club and the idea was that there was going to be a band and people could get up rather like it happened at the, the one I described before with Val. Um, it didn't quite go very smoothly uh, in terms of the sort of transition of people getting up. But as the band left, uh, they shouted, where are the Brits? There are some Brits. And, and <laughs> Brits in question were myself, Stuart Neville and Doug Johnston. And we just sort of shambled up on stage with a, with a, a, a New Orleans crime writer called Bill LaFalm, who was with us, who, who, who could drum. So he started drumming and we just absolutely busked our way through Folsom Prison Blues by Johnny Cash and Werewolves of London by Warren Zevon and 500 Miles by the Proclaimers, right? <laughs> and, uh, it, it went very well and somebody put it on YouTube and then we just got contacted by the, the, the programmer for the Edinburgh Book Festival who said, right, I'm programming you to do an hour and a half at the Edinburgh Book Festival in August. And we went, A. Eh? Um, and so we had a few months to just basically put the rest of the band together um which turned out to be val and chris brookmeyer and the brilliant luca veste who, who, who's an amazing bass player i mean should say that there are there are three incredible musicians in this band who are Stuart, uh doug and luca um and the rest of us i mean i sing and play guitar chris sings and plays guitar val sings she's up front she's our debbie harry and um you know, we're, we're sort of riding on the coattails of, of three really good musicians. But we, we rehearse when we can, which tends to be once every six months because we're all in different parts of the world. Um, and we put together a, you know, 14 or 15 song set and we're loving it. I mean, we were at the Winter Words Festival in Pitt Lockery on Saturday night and, and had a great show. And it's just, um, it's something a bit different. You know, people see all our names on a bill and they might have read our books or they might have read some people's books, but they don't know what they're in for. And they come along and we, you know, we rock and roll for an hour and a half. All the songs are about murder. So they're all cover versions of songs about murder. You know, watching the detectives by Elvis Costello, I Fought the Law by The Clash. There's Johnny Cash, there's Hank Williams, there's there's the Rolling Stones, there's all sorts of stuff in there, you know. Well, I had a friend um, who was so, there on Saturday night and said you, you, you all knocked it out of the park. Uh, it was great. Was so, you won't believe how much fun we have doing it. It's, you know, a lot of middle-aged crime writers uh, indulging rock star fantasies, you know, but it's, uh, it's terrific fun. I love the way you describe yourself as a twisted collective of musically inclined crime writers who enjoy murdering songs for fun. Yeah, that's exactly, <laughs> that's exactly what we do. Uh, we just take the... And, and we all have very different musical influences. That's the thing. You know, Stuart is kind of rock. I'm country, Val is folk. You know, uh, Chris is a bit more indie. So when we talk about what new songs we're going to do, there's all sorts of things get thrown into the mix. And, and it just makes for a very interesting set. But every time we've got a gig on the horizon, next one is Glasgow in a couple of weeks at the R 
Far Right Festival. We just we just get so hyped up. It makes the only downside is it makes writing seem terribly dull. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean that's it. You see, Mark, you're an international best-selling author, broadcaster, a wonderful po- a podcaster. I, I have to say, um, uh, I love your podcast. Uh, oh, thank you. Uh, it's great. Um, uh, and also, you know, comedian raconteur. I mean, where do you squeeze the time out to do absolutely everything? Do you have a really disciplined work ethic or how would you describe yourself as uh, I'd as... love to say I had a terribly disciplined work ethic I mean it's di- but it's not true I mean it's disciplined in one way the book always gets done I've, I've written a book a year now for kind of 18 years uh it always gets done because I'm fairly good at just time management I think I think I, I I look at the diary and I go okay well that's a week you've got to spend writing because the following week you're you know you've got two gigs coming up you're you've got a lot of traveling and I can't write when I'm on the road I'm terrible at doing that so I have to say that is writing time and that is you know pimping time yes. or whatever <laughs> that is showing off time um and I, I just managed to to get it done. I'm quite anal in 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 the way I can organise stuff. Um, the actual writing isn't disciplined at all. Well, as you know, I mean, it's not it's not nine to five, is it? It's no. you can't make yourself do it. But it's the book is in your head all the time. So actually, even if I'm I'm you know backstage about to go on stage with the fun loving crime writers, I'm I'm thinking about the book on one level. It's always in your head, you know, when you're pushing a trolley around a supermarket or walking the dog or whatever it is, you're still working stuff out and, and ideas will come to you. You're always working, aren't you? Well, there's a common perception. Well, you always think, yeah, absolutely, you're always working. Unless you're hitting the QWERTY, no one thinks you're working. No, uh, it's <laughs> ridiculous because hitting the QWERTY is just when you're... T- that's typing. Yes. It's not, you know, um, so much of it takes place in, 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 at other times and in, in other spaces. You know, as you drift away, drift, drift away to sleep at night, you start thinking, that's what I need to do. And because it's crime fiction, you, you're inevitably trying to, you know, and, and plotting is, is very important. You might just hit a brick wall and have to walk away for a while. Because you go, how am I going to sort this out? What I, I painted myself into a corner, and then three days later, in the shower, you suddenly go, right, that's how to solve it. And then, then you can't wait to get back to the to the keyboard and get it down. Well, you've also had a, a, a huge success with uh, television transpositions of your work. I mean, a great favourite of mine was Thorn and David. I thought was absolutely terrific. And, Wasn't it? Yeah, uh, yeah. Oh, I absolutely loved it, loved it. And of course, uh, more recently in the dark, uh, yeah. uh, bringing Alison Weeks um, to the to the screen superbly. I thought. Um, and you, you have a, a, another pr- a project, uh, Rush of Blood. Am I right in saying that that's uh, being developed for television? Yeah, uh, uh, I mean, it got it. Uh, you say I've had. Success. Success on television. I mean, I'm very lucky that those shows have been made, um, but there's also been a fair amount of bad luck. I mean, I, I shouldn't moan, I suppose, but you know, Thorn Thorn should have got on, uh, and we were we were well into developing the next series of Thorn when when you know the the uh, head of drama at the BBC left. That happens every um, three weeks, it seems sorry, to me. Sorry, this was Sky. This was Sky. A, a uh, new Thorn. brush sweeps clean. It always happens yeah, in television. Absolutely, and it and it happened again with In the Dark. Um, you know the way TV works. You know how slowly it, that those those oh. <laughs> wheels turn. Um, so that by the time In the Dark went out, it hadn't been commissioned by the head of current head of drama. It hadn't even been commissioned by that person's predecessor, but by that person's predecessor. Um, and you know, so so when when uh, the people in those positions that aren't invested in a show. And as you say, new new brooms and all that kind of stuff. And with Rush of Blood, it was it was even worse. That show was not just commissioned; it was green lit. It was green lit, and it was announced, you know, to the press yes. uh, at a big big BBC uh, posh bash. And then the writer quit. The writer, um, I, basically, I think I think he got nominated for an Oscar, so decided he didn't want to. Quit. <laughs> um, that kind of thing, and and so that that's gone back onto the back burner. We're still developing it. That we've got brilliant new scripts written by a wonderful writer called John Donnelly, um, that are just terrific. So we're very hopeful Russia Blood will will one day hit well, the screen. Well, so am I because I, I I really look forward to seeing that. I mean, I I had a bittersweet moment last night because I I uh, went to uh, to bed with your new book at ten o'clock. Uh, the sweetness was I absolutely love it, especially after having uh, read uh, Die of Shame recently. And uh, uh, lovely to see 
see Nicola Tanner. Um, uh, and uh, the, the, the bitterness was I was still reading it at three o'clock in the morning. Oh, I'm sorry, so, but I'm, I'm no. I, so I'm, if I if I sound a little tired this morning, I, I did wonder why you turned up at my house at nine o'clock this morning, looking uh, very bleary eyed. It's, 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 it's a lovely way to go. And yet again, I mean, I know that you have the, 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 this um, theory which you practice perfectly about the big start and uh, the hook. You know, it was absolutely brilliant. I mean, I obviously I, I I knew part of it, so I felt at home straight away. But there was a you know, it, it just hits straight away. And loving well, I think that Tom was something, as I do, that was something I actually learned from from stand up. Um, I mean, uh, I didn't actually stop doing stand up probably until about nine nine years ago. So there was a big overlap when I was writing the books and still uh, gigging. Um, and you know, when you when you walk on stage at the comedy store, you can't you've got to hit quickly. You can't you can't say stick with me I'll get funny in ten minutes you know they'll start they'll start throwing glasses you know um, and and there's no question that you you know the opening of a book is is hugely important I mean it's all important but the opening is massively important the ending is massively important it's just that horrible bit in the middle uh, that you've got to you've got to get through but yeah and and I I write as a reader I kind of write I've always got a reader's hat on when I'm writing and I know that when I'm reading a book if that book hasn't engaged me after I don't know, 20, 30 pages, I'm putting it down. I'm giving up. I'm, I'm not one of these people that will plow through a book. Um, and I don't really understand those, those readers who do, because if you're not enjoying it, you know, reading is supposed to be a pleasurable activity. And, and if you're struggling with a book, for God's sake, put it down and pick up another one. There's too many good books out there, you know. Well, you'd turn off a t television programme or switch channels, wouldn't you? If it, if of you course you would. You of grip. course you would. You know, you wouldn't carry on listening to an album if, if the first three tracks were terrible. Um, I, I do think it's a weird thing. You know, readers don't owe writers anything. You know, a book, a book is written and it's read and, and it's a two part process. It's a deal. And and, you know, unless it's read, it doesn't kind of really exist. Um, and if a reader doesn't get something out of it or isn't enjoying it, they've they've got every right to just put it down and go, no. Nope. Mm -hmm. I mean, on, on the on the subject of, um, you know, you when you're writing, you're you're doing it as a reader, you're sort of looking at it through through the reader's eyes. That kind of leads me on to another question we had from uh, Lynn Gator Schofield on Facebook, um, who wanted to know about your um, your thoughts of David Morrissey playing Tom Thorne, and, and and from that I wanted to kind of try and get whether the, what you have seen of Thorne um, influences how you how you write him, whether that, that kind of feeds back into your your books again. Well, firstly, David, um, David was the actor I always wanted to play Thorne. I got incredibly lucky. I, um, you know, from the very first moment your first book is produced, people say, oh, who would you like to play your character on TV? They, for some, they think we're all obsessed with it. Uh, <laughs> and they ask now. And, and, and I'd seen David be brilliant in all sorts of stuff, in State of Play and in Blackpool. And, and um, I, I just hit upon this, this ruse of saying his name as often as possible in interviews. <laughs> say, and I'd say, David Morris, and I thought one day he's going to find out about it. Anyway, so. I might try that with Brad Pitt. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, do it, do yeah. it. It worked like a charm. One day, David was filming somewhere uh, abroad and had a day off, and he wandered into a bookshop and he bought a pile of books, and one of them was mine. And he read it, he liked it, he Googled me, he Googled my name, and up came his name. Oh, scary! And he went, and he went, blimey, looks like I'm playing this bloke. And he, <laughs> he came back to London. He called me. We met up. I mean, it, it just worked like a dream. Oh, wow. uh, and he's he he was brilliant as Thorne because he's such a smart actor and he did such a lot of work into stuff like Thorne's backstory. I mean, actually coming up with stuff that that I, I wish I'd thought of. You know, he was very involved from the word go. Um, in terms of in terms of do do I does does his performance affect my writing? It really doesn't. Um, you know, it's something that Dave and I joke about. I say, you know, we we did some events together, and, and I was asked this, and I said, no, I'm sorry, I just don't see Dave at all when I write. And he said, well, I don't think about you when I'm acting, uh, <laughs> which is fair enough. Because the thing is, I'm I'm looking at the world through Thorne's eyes. I'm looking out at the world. What what Thorne looks like, it doesn't really bother me. It's never something I've really described in any detail. Readers is a different matter, of course. Readers who watch that show almost certainly do see. Uh, David Morrissey and Aidan Gillen as Hendrix or whatever it might be. I genuinely don't. It's, it's uh, a strange thing, isn't it? Because I've had a, a, a similar kind of thing. I I don't know what any of my characters look like at yeah. all. Because um, as you say, you're looking at, at things through their eyes rather than looking at them. And people say, you know, who do you want to play this person? They come up with their ideas and I'm yeah. trying to kind of imagine these, these actors playing them. And it's a very, very strange, surreal thing. I mean, I, again, also, I've... If you, if, you, if you describe your character too much... Yeah. 
you are doing the reader's job for them. Exactly. I mean, that is the, exactly. you know, the joy of reading. Yeah. You know, the minute a character walks onto the page of a book, you start to picture them. You start to put flesh on the bones. Um, and, it, and it struck me how, how much that happened when about a month before Thorn was aired, we had a pre we had a sort of big 10 minute preview of it and we showed it at the Edinburgh Book Festival and, and I was sitting on the stage and the lights went down and they showed this preview and the lights went up again and I was really, you know, pleased and full of myself and said, so what do you think? And the woman at the front row just went, he's too tall. <laughs> <laughs> just go, okay, well, you, you know, do you know what I mean? That yeah. he, he doesn't fit that person's image of Thorn um, and that's fine. Um, or, you know what, in these situations, all you want is a good actor. That's really all you can hope for. If you get a good actor, you're fine. That's the beauty of a book over a TV series or a film, I suppose, isn't it? That you can put yeah. your own spin on it and you put your own twist and you, you could see the character looking Of course, the book is different. yours. It's yours, you know, and nobody else will see those pictures. Um, and the same thing, oddly, has, has, I think, changed the way I write in terms of when I write about violence. I think, I think the early books, looking back, were, were too violent. I, I think I can hold my hand up to that and say that they were because for several reasons. Firstly, I think, you know, when you, with your early books, you are tempted to throw the kitchen sink at it, you know, you kind of. And also that seemed to be what people were buying at the time. Um, as I've gone on and, and hopefully become a better writer than I was uh, back then, I, I think I've learned that less is more because readers can imagine that stuff. You know, you just need to nudge them towards the, the darkness and and uh, you don't need to put every every gout of blood up the wall and all that stuff. I, I don't like reading that stuff anymore and, and therefore I think that's why it's changed how I write. I suppose there's more power in what your own mind can come up with. It's very similar to, 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 to imagining the character yourself, isn't it? And I know that a lot yeah. of horror directors and, and film directors know this very well, that you don't actually need to show something happening it's no you don't want to show the monster do you yeah no, i mean it's no, uh, exactly. it, it's much scarier it's much scary without and and you know it's a line i've used before but a single drop of blood on a, on a pristine kitchen floor seems to me a far more powerful image than that blood soaked you know whatever um so yeah i mean don't get me wrong i'm still writing about violence and actually i still think the books are darker actually than they used to be um and perhaps that's one of the reason the kind of the threat and the darkness and the shadow is is there all the time rather than here's another body here's another crime scene here's another post-mortem here's a you know i don't want to do that anymore no no mm. No, well, I, now there's something that's come out of I was been watching Collateral, um, and reading a few reviews of David Hare, which is a yeah. crime political thriller or whatever. I don't know whether you've seen it. But, I haven't. Actually, I haven't uh, seen but it. there's a, a, a lot of things have come up about the the main character, uh, uh, played by Gary Mulligan, uh, as a, a detective uh, in, inspector in charge of this murder. Uh, operation and uh, people saying one she gives a wonderfully compelling uh, performance as you'd expect but there's this debate that seems to have popped up about fictional coppers are they overly uh, dramatized do they bear any relation to <laughs> the ones who turn up you know god forbid at your house or or you know at, at crimes and people saying well no they don't and how do you feel about that should they i mean obviously you want to do your research and be as authentic as possible but there's also got to be a sense of entertainment because as a writer you're job is partly to entertain to keep people gripped by a story of and course it is. does that influence how you portray characters at all yeah i mean i think that's a, that's a really good question i mean the thing is you you, you want to have to 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 give the reader completely realistic characters realistic fully formed human beings but whether or not they're realistic coppers is a completely different question i mean if if, if the books we wrote accurately reflected the way a murder was investigated they'd be a thousand pages long they'd be extremely dull you wouldn't be that satisfied with the ending so it's like a heightened reality we create and it's a deal you make with the reader that if that character is engaging enough They'll, they'll forgive the fact that actually, you know, a detective inspector wouldn't be tearing around, knocking on doors. You know, they'd be up to their neck in paperwork and all that kind of stuff. And and, and those sort of corners you have to cut in order to make a book 400 pages as opposed to 4,000 pages. Um, so, no, of course they're not. You know, I mean, I, I've had dealings with a lot of coppers over the years it, uh, for research purposes. I should I should clarify that. Um and, and no, they're not. They are not all haunted by past cases. They don't go home and listen to, to country music or jazz or whatever it might be. They don't have problems with the bottle. I mean, maybe some of them do, but most of them are dressed like accountants and, you know, wander about with their lanyards on, doing doing it, being extremely efficient, uh, not making mistakes, not barking up the wrong tree, not being mavericks. But there are kind of boxes you have to tick. Um 
that I think are honoring detectives of the past. I mean, really, I was thinking about this. There are not too many differences between Sherlock Holmes and, you know, John Rebus or Harry Bosch or Tom Thorne. There, there really aren't in terms of those characters, you know, socially dysfunctional, um, you know, lovers of music, problems with substances, all, all that kind of stuff. You know, sitting there shooting bullet holes in the wall when, when, uh, when, when, when he can't crack a case. It's amazing to think that Sherlock Holmes is over a century old and actually those, those, those archetypes are still knocking around. Yes. Do you think that's why Thorne has, has been so popular? Popular because um, another comment we had from uh, Kim Albine on Facebook said um, that Tom Thorne seems so real. Um, is it? Do you think it is because he kind of fits nicely into that um, stereotype almost of what we expect from a fictional copper? Yeah, like I said, there are certain boxes you have to tick, and if you don't want to tick them, then that's fine. But you, maybe you shouldn't be writing that kind of book. You know, write write a western by all means, in which your cowboy doesn't have a hat or a horse or a gun, but he's probably not a cowboy. Um, you know, nobody's making, nobody's making anybody write these kind of books. You know, I am a writer of popular fiction, you know, uh, of genre based fiction. I love crime fiction. I always have loved it. Um, and like I say, first and foremost, I'm a, I'm a reader of it. Um, and I, th- I think, you know, one of the reasons series characters become real to people is because there's just so much of them. Uh, you know, you can really explore a character when you're doing it over 20 books in a way that you kind of can't in one book. You know, I think it might have been uh, Ian Rankin who said it's like writing one very long book in 20 chapters. Um, and you see a, you see characters change, you see their domestic situations change, you see them fall in love, fall out of love, you see people around them die, you, you know, um, in a way that if you crammed all that into one book, it would be too much. But but over a series, you can uh, you can really explore a character. Do you have this kind of ongoing battle as well, which which is something I've had, where things do happen in the character's personal lives and they need to be progressed. And you think, well, you know, I didn't I didn't see this character ever getting married or falling in love or yeah. you know yeah. I didn't didn't want their cat to die, but you know it, it, the cat's going to be thirty five if I if I don't do something <laughs> about that. These, these things you kind of have to do, and it, it's quite painful in a way, isn't it? Yeah, and do you know what? I, I, I remember having a conversation once with a wonderful British crime writer, John Harvey, who's a, a, a friend. And really early on, I remember him saying to me, we were talking about writing crime fiction, and he was talking about what he called the looking out of the window moments. The kind of moments in a book where it isn't crash, bang, wallop and stuff happening and action, but the character is just sitting there. Um, and you see, and his looking out the window moments are rather like Harry Bosch's back porch moments. You know, when, when Michael Connolly's character will sit there looking out over the canyon, listening to some jazz and just thinking about stuff. And I remember saying to John, oh, no, I'm never going to go down that road. I'm, I'm much too interested in the crash bang wallop. And he said, just you wait. And five or six books later, I thought, oh, my God, he's absolutely right. They're, they're the bits I really enjoy writing. The bits that really are just about that human being. Yes, he's got a case to solve, but he's also got a life, you know. And, um, and you know, the feedback I get from readers uh, leads me to believe that they, they like that stuff too. They like it when he's just sitting in the pub with Phil Hendricks just chatting about stuff. Uh, and, yeah, by the end of the chapter, by the end of the chapter, of course, they will, you know, they'll get back to the case. The crash but... bang wallet will be back. But, <laughs> but you're, you're, you're gaining an entrance. It's a little portal into the, your, your characters' lives and personality, which you don't necessarily see in procedure. Although you, this is one thing I love. And you, the humour, understandably, in your books does come through, the wryness and the darkness of it. You know, I was just reading, you know, last night about Tom giving the finger to a, to a <laughs> someone who's just been committed, uh, who's just been sentenced, uh, uh, found guilty of, of murder. And this is in the old Bailey, and I laughed out loud. <laughs> I thought, you know, that's that's ter- that, that's terrific. Do you find that that you your humour uh, obviously infuses the way you write? Um, do you find that easy? Well, I mean, to be honest, I I, I need to kind of rein it in. I mean, <laughs> yes, I'm my, sure. my my first instinct in in any situation is usually comedic. Yeah. Um, you know, when I very first started writing stories, and I was twelve or thirteen at school, they were always funny stories, or I was trying to write funny stories so that I could be, you know, the teacher would ask me to come out to front of the class and read them out. Um, and you know, twenty five years of stand up comic and stuff, I, I I tend to look for the funny. Um, and obviously, these are not those kind of books. There is humour in them. Oh, God, there I is. hope there is. There oh, has to be. I, I, yes, there is. Believe. But there me. has to be in any in any novel, even the darkest of. I can't read a novel that doesn't have a vein of of, of humour in there somewhere because it's just unbearably bleak. And you know, you want to hear jokes flying around. You go to a murder scene. 
or you talk to paramedics or you and because those people have to have humor as a sort of coping mechanism um otherwise they'd go quietly mad uh so yeah they, you know sometimes funny things happen in very dark moments and i want there to be a vein of humor but i haven't created thorn as a kind of gag merchant he's not a wisecracker he's not philip marlowe or you know he's the sort of person who'd think of a joke three days later mm. uh, <laughs> so i give those those jokes to phil hendricks or, yes. or to something else but but um yeah i i, I love putting th those odd little lines in and um i had a lot of fun in the early books with with uh, the character of thorn's father who had i'd i'd um i'd done a lot of research into alzheimer's because it was something i thought i needed to get right if you're going to write about that stuff and uh thorne's father has you know in the latter stages of alzheimer's he starts to lose any degree of kind of social niceties and i think the favorite thing one of the favorite things i've ever written in a book is where thorne and he are at a bingo game uh in a seaside town and his dad just loses it and just starts swearing and shouting. Uh, uh, but, you know, when the bingo, when he making up his own filthy bingo calls. Um, <laughs> just one of the most enjoyable things I've ever written. Hopefully, of course, also deeply tragic and sad. But, um, God, yeah, no, I, the day I stop finding things funny is the day I will want to turn my toes up on it. <laughs> well, all of that has obviously made the books extremely popular, all, all of those different elements you've, you've, you've spoken about. And that's something that's backed up by the, the most popular question that we had submitted to us. Um, Yvonne Wilson and David Lawrence on Facebook and Stephanie Shepard on Twitter wanted to know when your next book's out. So ah. he's obviously a very, very popular character, Tom. Thorne. Well, well, the book that, that uh, Bobby's talking about, which is Love Like Blood, is out in paperback, I think, in three weeks. Um, but the next Thorn novel, which is called The Killing Habit, is out on June the 14th. Wow. June so the 14th. Yeah, and, and in June the States, the uh, Love Like Blood's out in the States. Uh, is it... Oh, Love Like Blood has, been, has already been out in the States. Love Like Blood has been out. You know, they, it, they, I publish in the States around the same time as I publish here, usually give or take a few weeks. So, um, yeah, they, they will also be publishing The Killing Habit in June, I think. And The Killing Habit, again, again rather like Love Like Blood, I never thought I'd do this, two, two books running, but to a degree based on or inspired by a real, a real case, an ongoing case that's unsolved. Oh, wow. um, the case of the, the Croydon cat killer, the UK cat killer. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, yes. And so that, that's the kind of inspiration for the, for the new book. Although I should warn any animal lovers out there that nothing nasty happens to any animal on, on the page. If there's one thing I've learned, you do not do that. No, no, no. <laughs> that doesn't tend to go down too well, does it? No, God, no. You can do anything you like to people, but, uh, but harm, harm a, a hair of an animal's head and they'll come after you. So, you know, even though this, you know, this is a horrific case. I mean, it's really, um, it's an odd case. And I had a sort of in, I was able to get reasonably close to that investigation and, and, some of the theories they've got are just bizarre and interesting, and, and I knew it was something I wanted to write about. I can't, can't wait to read that. Um, we'll end on a, a, a humorous note, I think. Uh, Jay Stringer, a um, fellow, <laughs> fellow crime writer. Uh, you laugh when you hear his name. You know what's coming, don't you? I know what's coming. <laughs> he wants to know where you think Wolves are going to finish next season. <laughs> next season? Well, as long as we finish in the Premiership, because we are going up this season. Uh, I mean, if we don't, it's... it's they, we talk about snatching defeat from the jaws of victory. We're, what, 13 points clear at the top of the championship now, yes. I think. Uh, if we don't go up, it will be an absolute disaster. And, of course, once you've gone up after years in the championship, you've just got to try and stay up. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not presuming Wolves are going to are going to be in Europe. Uh, well, it's, it's the second season, which is the hardest. Is that, that, that tricky absolutely. second now, one second book. It's, it's easy yeah. Either. But I mean, we, we are playing great football at the minute, and uh, you know, if we can just get up and fit, you know, mid table in the Premiership next year will be a massive result for us. Yeah. Do you ever get a chance to see them live? Yeah. Yes, oh okay. no! Now yes, now and again, yeah. now and again. I'm, I'm I'm hoping to go and see them play Fulham, but it's a big game actually yeah. next next weekend. I think. Um, yeah, when I can, I'm you know I'm much more of a part time supporter than Jay. Jay Jay will will you know is an absolute fanatic, knows everything there is to know. Um, they were the first team I ever saw, you know. So so and they were a great side back then, and that's why Thor's, Thorn is a Spurs supporter. I mean, it's kind of weird because. I wanted Th Thorne to support a slightly ailing football team who <laughs> like sleeping giants, you know, past glories and all that. And back then that was Spurs. Yeah. yeah. When I started writing, were I to create him again, he wouldn't be a Spurs fan because they're doing far too well. I don't know, Cuban <laughs> star fan or Crystal Palace fan or something. But, oh, well, uh, well, uh, we'll not talk too much about Spurs on this podcast. I was going to say next season, I'll um, I'll pop up to Molyneux and Arsenal are playing. We'll have to have a, a couple of beers and catch the football. Abs no, that'd be, that's a great idea. We'll do that. <laughs> 
Thank you, Mark. It's been fantastic talking to you. Thank you very Thanks, much. Thanks, Mark. Time. All the very best. Thanks ever so much, Adam. Thanks, Bob. Take care. You too. Bye bye. I think I've just done myself out of 30 quid there by offering my round of drinks. Uh, money well spent. It is, absolutely. And it's another fascinating interview there with Mark. We've, we seem to be getting some, some great guests and some, some fantastic stories out of Well, we're very fortunate that Mark is, is, you know, is such a great communicator yeah. uh, on so many subjects uh, and, so, and, and so wonderfully entertaining. And, uh, um, it must be so scary, though, to be in that situation you were talking about, being kidnapped and, and held hostage and tied up. I suppose it's... You've got to write from a new perspective after something like that, haven't you? Well, I guess so. And I, I imagine, I think I'm right in saying that he started writing crime novels uh, after yeah. that event. So, you know, I mean, it's a, just a truly terrifying thing. And as he was so eloquently, uh, yeah. said so eloquently, you know, it, it sort of informed from the first hand nature mm. his response to fear and his ability to write about people in appalling uh, and desperate situations mm. so well, which, you know, he does. Yeah. Um, I mean, if any kidnapping, are listening I'm quite happy not to uh, to have the realism and just to continue making it up I you know I'm not uh, I, don't, I don't want anyone to kidnap me just to make my books more realistic well they might have to think of kidnapping you we've decided we should announce really to uh, to our listeners that we uh, Adam and I inspired by Mr Billingham and Val McDermott and uh, and, and friends uh, <laughs> their fun loving crime writers we are forming a two man band called Badly Sounding Crime Writers Adam on Spoons <laughs> and me on the Bongos and I can play the triangle as well it can- well, listen, our ding, cup ding. runneth over. Absolutely, yes. It's uh, full of full of talent on this show. Uh, well, full of something. <laughs> full of something. <laughs> uh, if you uh, like the sound of Mark's books, why not go and get one on Kobo? They've got more than five million titles available, and as a listener to Partners in Crime, you can get a very exclusive ninety percent off of your first ebook with them. Just uh, put the books into your basket and enter the promo code crime at the checkout and uh, your first book will be yours with with 90 percent off now next week's show is going to be a, an absolute cracker as well I'm talking about dragging out the big names i think we're uh, we're peaking again tell me about it with um with peter james ah, yes. who is uh, possibly the biggest selling british crime writer in the world right now with more than 20 million books sold i think i'm right in saying in the, the Roy Grace series set in Brighton, which has just become an absolute phenomenon over here and on the, the other side of the pond as well. Yes, I mean, uh, Peter is, uh, again, like Mark, uh, uh, one of the great communicators uh, amongst uh, the crime writers. Uh, he not only writes these extraordinarily brilliant books, but he uh, talks uh, regularly. Um, he is a huge enthusiast uh, for all things crime writing, um, and uh, he's a wonderful, wonderful chap. Uh, his what's interesting is he started in the film world uh, before he started writing that uh, comes through books. very much in his books though They're yeah very he has style. a real eye for, for that filmic quality and he was a producer and writer and goodness knows uh, what else and he's a fascinating uh, man to listen to many of our readers may have actually uh, tuned into his uh, his uh, podcast his uh, Peter James TV which is uh, uh, absolutely <laughs> he's everywhere now isn't oh he? yeah which is which is absolutely great and or caught him at, at festivals but uh, he i think he's going to be well i know he's going to be a wonderful guest and uh, we're looking forward very much to having a chat with peter mm, we've been extremely fortunate with the the people who have uh, agreed to give up their time to to speak to us and if you have any suggestions for future guests um please do send them to us we very much do take them um take them seriously we've interviewed now two or three people who have been suggested directly by by listeners to partners in crime so if you have somebody you want us to speak to or a topic you want us to cover please do get in touch touch you can email us hello at partnersincrime.online you can go to our website and send us a message from there that's partnersincrime.online and we're on facebook as well under partners in crime podcast and on twitter at crime fic podcast but i think that's about it for this week i think it is we're going to get some business cards um done now aren't we you're going to the <laughs> printers i say business cards uh, pa- yes. Partners in, in in crime cards. It's all glamour, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we, 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 we're we're going to take that up to uh, Granite Noir at the weekend. Yes. Uh, and um, so that will be a great future episode. Actually, we were just talking about that off air about um, and on location. Yes, you taking the the recording gear up there and and grabbing some of the the fantastic crime writers and guests at Granite Noir. If the recording equipment works, I say if the recording equipment works. Uh, if you can work the recording equipment, this is 
this is the main obstacle to a successful coverage of Granite Noir on on tape for ourselves. I am I, well. well it, it, it will be a young, fantastic hopeless. episode if you if you do manage to yeah. Uh, to well, pull that off. bound to go wrong. I mean, I'm not. I'm fairly an optimistic person, but I don't really hold out much hope on the technical side. Um, well, I've um, I, I've I've, I've really kind of. Uh, uh, tucked you up a little bit there because by the time this episode goes out um you will already be at granite noir so i've um you know, you know you've, got, you've got to do it now you've well got, you're giving me a tape recorder to take is it real yeah. to real is it i mean uh, it's it's not no it's a little more advanced than this that. is the bbc home service <laughs> live from aberdeen um uh, no I, I will do my best i can honestly say hugh fraser and i are going up uh, uh, at the, the weekend looking forward to it tremendously and i will be i'll pump my person a digital recorder and i'll try and catch as much of it as i possibly can yeah. uh, and if you're there don't at Brandon, hold your I'll, breath if you're there by all means go and chat to bobby you may find yourself on a on an episode of Partners in Crime in a couple of weeks' time. Yes, and, and, uh, you. don't try and vlog me insurance. I'm absolutely fine from an insurance point of view. But if you want to talk about anything crime, uh, any views you have, and you see me loitering with intent, tap me on the shoulder <laughs> and we'll have a conversation. <laughs> don't report him. Go and talk to him. <laughs> uh, and we'll be back uh, next week with Peter James. So uh, that'll be episode six. Is it really? I think so. Oh, I, th- I think so, yeah. We're... Uh, I think we're outstaying our welcome. Well, but, that's, that's but we're going to carry on until someone tells us to stop, aren't we? So. Well, yes. Can you hear anyone? The phone starts going, stop! <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you next week. Partners in Crime was presented by Adam Croft and Robert Dawes and produced by Adam Croft. The theme tune was by the Caesarians. The Partners in Crime logo and imagery were designed by Stuart Beish. Partners in Crime is sponsored by Kobo, your favourite local bookshop, perfected. Perfected.